So hi all, <laughs> my name is Nat and I'm the head of community at Exceptional Individuals. For those of you who are new, we support neurodiverse people. So anyone who's at working age and above, who's looking to get their foot in the door, to get their self up that career ladder, or just want to understand their brains better. We also work with organizations that help people be more inclusive, more understanding, and to not just see neurodivergence as something to work around, but something to really, to really grasp and harness. And as such, we do these webinars every single Thursday in order to spread awareness and um, to teach people a thing or two if we're able to. Now, another thing which I always like to mention is that the vast majority of people on our team, including myself, are neurodiverse. So we're experts by experience and also qualified. Currently, I'm doing a master's in neuroscience, as well as a whole heap of other stuff. I know it's bloody difficult, but really interesting. So as I said, today we are focusing on dyslexia, though we do support the whole spectrum of neurodivergence, focusing predominantly on dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, ADHD. Now here, as I said, we are a lovely neurodivergent team. We do everything under the sun from the A to the Z to the neurodivergent. But if you are interested in our previous webinars, Sandra, probably very relevant to yourself. We record all our webinars and they're on our YouTube channel. The one we did last week was the science of ADHD drugs. Really interesting. We get into the neuroscience of things, but we do it from a really easy, accessible way that would benefit anyone. All our workshops are open to everyone, but they are purposely created in a way which hopefully resonates with those who are neurodivergent, who actually have ADHD. Because typically we are not told what it is. We are just told we have it. And this is kind of myth busting, breaking it down. So check that out in your own time. But a quick thing on what is dyslexia. I'm guessing most of you will be aware, but for those of you who are not, Dyslexia is a developmental learning disorder which has impairments in reading. It is characterized by significant and persistent difficulties in learning. So in a nutshell, this little image I think is a good way to give you an idea of what dyslexia is like. Hopefully, most of you can read this. A friend of you who has described dyslexia to me experiences reading. She can read, but she takes a lot of concentration and the letters seem to jump around. I remember reading about I don't know. And that's exactly what dyslexia is. It's not someone who cannot read. It's someone who takes longer to process reading. And that's what we're going to be looking at again today is how people develop and process language. People with dyslexia can improve over time, but it doesn't get rid of their dyslexia. It's more that they learn to manage their dyslexia. And the world is a very vast place. Not all countries are at the same level of understanding and research. And I think today is going to show that. But not just looking at differences in cult country, we're also going to be looking at differences in culture. And do not worry, we are going to be defining what culture is because I appreciate it's a massive word. So first of all, where are you? I, uh, I know obviously we've got Germany, definitely. We've got the UK. It'd be really great because obviously all our opinions are going to be different. Feel free, though, to if you are, say, in the UK right now, but originally you're from another country, feel free to put that because that is going to change quite significantly on your views. Oh, nice. We've got India. UK. I want to say South Africa. I might get slightly off on the locations, but I can see some good, good variations already. Nice. So three different continents. That's not bad. So let's start things off with Indonesia and Germany. Now, it seems weird, right, to group these countries together, but they actually have a really long relationship. You know, they're, they're not bad friends. Um, so they often do re uh, like they often do research to um, between the two countries. Now, this is really interesting. Because when you normally look at research, um, particularly with learning difficulties and dyslexia, et cetera, they're normally based in one region, not even around the country. So in the UK, the study will be based in London and it will not include people in Scotland. 
to have a study which includes two demographics from opposite sides of the world is really interesting. Now, credit given where credit is due, I'm taking this research from children with dyslexia in different cultures, an investigation of anxiety and coping strategies of children with dyslexia in Indonesia and Germany. So 2019, pretty recent. So on this, where do you think is the least understanding of dyslexia in the world? So what country do you think might have the least amount of research or the least amount of knowledge to date? OK, so we've got someone who put uh, Africa or Central Africa. I know Africa is not a country, but a lot of the time it is lumped together. Let's say you're saying about the Congo. OK, nice. South America. I'm going to say Venezuela or Brazil. Who knows where that dot is? But most of you would be right. Non-Western countries do tend to have less research, but they have way more than they've ever had in the past. The culture of caring about dyslexia is changing drastically, and maybe there's a reason behind that. So first question to all of you, does culture affect dyslexia in children? And think carefully about this, because when we think about culture, we're talking about upbringing, environment, surroundings. So, you know, with some things, if you break a bone in one country, it should be the same if you break a bone in another country. But with something that you can't see, like dyslexia, does it get impacted by the world around us? All of you have put yes, and yes, it does. But the way it is impacted does change depending on the country you grew up in, depending on the language that you speak, and depending on your beliefs and, you know, family around you. So it is really interesting when you look at low rates of dyslexia in different countries. It is, however, really difficult to say with complete clarity because, for instance, less people in China have dyslexia compared to the UK. So would you think maybe, why is that? Is it because the characters of Mandarin are more picture-based and visual and such people would struggle with reading less? Maybe. Or Maybe it's because less research is done, so they do not have the evidence. So you've always got to take multiple factors in consideration. So on this, does culture affect dyslexia in children? Well, that study that I mentioned found that dyslexia had a significant effect on separation and generalized anxiety. Really interesting because you wouldn't naturally put those two together, but they found a strong correlation. While an incredible cultural effect is valid for support seeking coping strategies. So let's break that down. What do we actually mean? Well, we found out depending what country you live in, dyslexia does have an impact on your mental well being. This could be anxiety, separation, or generalized. But really interestingly, though culture does have a big impact, it's the one of the biggest impacts is the support that is available. So, for instance, yes, it looked quite similar in Germany and Indonesia, but the biggest difference was how it was supported. And that had the impact on the anxiety. So dyslexia in itself doesn't necessarily make you anxious, but it's the support and the culture around you that has the biggest lasting impact. That might not be groundbreaking to you, but having it done in research is a really big step in the right direction. We've got a comment from Sanjan that says the pressure to succeed in countries like India and Japan means that problems with studying are overlooked. Sanjan, you're completely right. And different cultures, I mean, particularly, you know, ones in like uh, China or a Asian communities where there is a big emphasis on success in, in some areas, does make dyslexia more challenging, not just because it, you, know, you are looked down upon for having it, but also you wouldn't talk about it. It's something you keep quiet. You wouldn't like talk about it as a positive. And that does have lasting repercussions. The next country we're gonna be looking at is the Netherlands. And who doesn't love the Netherlands? So they are also really big on research. 
and they have done some really interesting studies. The one we're going to be looking at right now is called The Difference in Neurocognitive Aspects of Dyslexia in Dutch and Immigrant 6 to 7 and 8 to 9 year old children. Now, when we say Dutch, obviously it's a language, so it does go beyond the Netherlands, but the Netherlands was where most of it was done, but it was open to all. And when they say immigrants, they don't mean they perhaps like they split the two categories up. They're just meaning people who weren't born, um, but learned Dutch. So <laughs> weren't born. Of course they were born, but you know what I mean. So true or false, before I tell you what the study actually learned. First one is screening is harder as children get older. Is that true or false? The second one, dyslexic children usually show slower reading. True or false? And dyslexia takes longer to read irrespective of the culture. Now, let's see what I can see answer. Let's see what the answers are. Oh, nice. So dyslexia is harder as children get older. No, that's not true. It's been found, particularly from these studies, that the older you get, the easier it is to screen dyslexia. And I, uh, that predominantly, they believe anyway, a hypothesis is that it's because when you're growing, you're still developing and it's difficult to tell what is considered normal or average and what is just childhood. But as you get, as you're an adult, you've mostly finished developing. So it's easier to compare where you sh should be or the majority of people are compared to where you are now. The next two were correct. So dyslexic children usually show slower reading. That's true. Most of us knew that already. And the last one is dyslexia takes long, dyslexics take longer to read irrespective of the culture. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world. If you're born in Japan, Germany, Indonesia, Australia, it will take you longer to read. The, regardless of language and regardless of the characters that you read. So whether it's Latin, I'm trying to think of other characters or any character, any different characters. But why do you think the world is now taking an active interest in dyslexia? It's really great to know all these research, but let's face it, this research, most of the ones that are outside Western countries is less than a decade old. Before then, nobody cared, or not really. Is there a reason why now we are starting to get this data from maybe less developed countries or countries that previously haven't put emphasis on this type of research? We've got more people are becoming aware of it. Absolutely. The more people are aware of it, the more people want to invest and put money into the areas. Anyone else? Why do you think the world is now taking an active interest in dyslexia? We've got awareness. Yep. Because more children, adults are being diagnosed and it affects the workforce. Yep. You know, if, if money's involved, people want to sort that out open-mindedness about change? Absolutely. Now, all these answers are correct, but there's one answer which I don't think anyone's mentioned, which has the biggest impact on research and development around the world. And that comes down to death. Oh, I know. But honestly, the less children are dying in the world. And hear me out, this has a massive impact on dyslexia. You wouldn't put the two and two together, but they do. And we mentioned this when we talked about um, the anthropology of autism. So essentially autism in culture. And when there is a massive death rate around the world, people do not care about things they cannot see or things like dyslexia, which do impact you on a day to day basis and can be significant, but typically aren't life threatening. So people are putting the research in like malaria, meningitis, like different cancers. And while we have been able to like lower those rates, we now have more resources and more time to put into areas which aren't life threatening, such as dyslexia. So the world getting better, more children being born and living to a good age is impacting the amount of time. So, yeah, awareness is great. 
but no one cares about awareness if your child is dying. So yeah, this is great news. And just on a little side note, for those of you who thinks the world is a dark place, yes, it is, but we're, we've got the most healthy, uh, more, most educated, most developed uh, world that we've ever lived in in human history. So something to be proud of that progress is being made. It's just, you've got to look at the data to see how far we've come. So back to another truth and a lie. The symptoms of dyslexia are universal. Do you think no matter where you are in the world, the symptoms all look the same? Next one is dyslexia is the same everywhere. So it doesn't matter if someone says they're dyslexic and they're in Korea, North Korea, let's say, would they still have dyslexia if they were in France? And then we've got dyslexia impacts on separation and anxiety in children. If you've been listening, you should hopefully know this one. And let's see. Oh, yeah. First two are wrong. Last one's right. So the symptoms of dyslexia are universal. They are not. And that's because different um, countries use different ways of diagnosing individuals. So most of America um, and other like uh, well, different well, half the world will use a DSM, which is the Diagnostic uh, Manual of Mental Conditions, uh, something along those lines. And UK and other countries will use the, um, what's the ISO. Or I don't. Someone help me out there. But that they'll use like the different the other version. And other countries will not even use any particular manual of diagnosis to begin with. So it really does depend where you are. Dyslexia to one country is different to dyslexia in another country. Obviously, it would probably be the same if you really looked into it. But because we don't have a universal, universal consensus, it's not a thing. Dyslexia is the same everywhere. No, it is different. And that is both nature v. nurture. It kind of goes back to the last one. Dyslexia impacts on separation and anxiety in children. And it, it really does. And the research backs it up. There's a lot of things when we think of conditions like dyslexia or dyspraxia, we always think of them at a very top level, like not being able to read or write or struggling with balance or communication. But there's so much more to the, each of these conditions. Some of them are inherently part of the condition and others other aspects of them come as a result of living with these conditions in a world which isn't designed or developed for your way of thinking. So definitely worth keeping in mind. This question is really important and I really encourage you all to answer if you're able to. What is culture? Could you summarize it in like one sentence? There isn't really a right or wrong answer here. So get creative with your answers and just say it from your point of view or your perspective. Okay, we've got different customs in various countries around the world. Yeah, that's a, a really nice one of saying it. I mean, the, the culture has like, the definition of it has developed over time, but it is interesting that we're using the word culture and not countries. I could have just said that uh, let, we're going to learn about dyslexia in different countries today, but in each country, there are different cultures. And this could be generational. So depending on your age, um, it could be different genders. It could be different religions. Depending where you are, there is such a big difference in how people view and see it. We've got general acceptance behavior based on religious or geographical location. Nice. The sum of values, habits, traditions, and much more. Traditions and religions, practices in a particular country. Yeah, all of you are spot on there. Now, with that in mind, has dyslexia always been real? And I want you to answer this with the kind of mindset of culture. Okay, we've got, we've got one person thinking, yeah, it is. Another person thinking, no, it isn't. Now, why this is an interesting question is if you are dyslexic, you know it's real. And if it's real for you, and it's a condition, it must have always been real. Well, the characteristics of dyslexia have always been real, but dyslexia in itself has not been real. 
you know, it is uh, something which was created, a term which kind of condensed loads of different characteristics, which which kept commonly appear in individuals that they group together and call dyslexia. And not every culture or country or language has a word for dyslexia. And, you know, if you were to go back 100 years, would anyone know dyslexia? Maybe, you know, one or two, 200 years, no. So dyslexia as a word and understanding has not always been real, but the symptoms and characteristics such as struggling with reading, uh, writing, have always existed. Or have they? Because it's only in the last um, few hundred years that reading has been common practice. So before the Industrial Revolution, was dyslexia real, even if it didn't have a name? Well, probably. But would it have been as big of a, I don't want to say issue, but, you know, issue? You know, it is really interesting to know that is dyslexia a consequence of us now having a population which is expected to read or would it not be there? So let's have a look what we got. Sanjan says, I think it was taught to be lazy or stupid or naughty. Yeah, in the early stages, definitely. Yeah, and whether or not cultures have seen dyslexia as a positive, as neutral or negative, does change dramatically over time. So I think now we are seeing dyslexia as an advantage in places. Just a few years ago, we were looking at it a bit more neutral. And when I was, uh, well, when a lot of us was growing up, it was still seen as stigmatized. And before then, could have been seen as mental health, like there is something actually wrong with your brain. So it has changed a lot. So in a nutshell, what is culture? Just repeating what all of you have already said, is the ideas, customs, and social behavior of a particular people or society. So you can have microcultures. You know, your home is its own culture. Your town has its own culture. Your city, your country, then your religions, your groups. Diagnoses are continuously being reframed in different historical periods. So as well as understanding the culture we have today, we also need to think of the culture at the time. So a lot of these studies, for instance, some of them were done in 1999, early 2000s. That in itself was its own kind of culture and period. So you do have to look at these lenses. When we looked at things like autism, we saw that in the day people used to think it was like a mental disorder. They thought there was something clinically wrong with you, schizophrenia. And it's very, very easy to see some of the ways they treated people with disabilities as barbaric. And to, let's face it, they were. But you've got to look at it at the time. Like what else did people believe at that time? New frameworks are not necessarily advances over the older one. And this is another interesting one because we like to think that the world and diagnosis and the way we see things is always on a up would projectural, like things are always getting better all the time. That's not necessarily the case. It's just different words and phrases will fit better with where we are as a society. So dyslexia has been seen as word blindness. Uh, it's been seen as a developmental condition as a learning disability, a learning different, as neurodivergent. Or if we look at other similar conditions, um, similar-ish like autism, it used to be called schizophrenia. I know originally, then it was, um, we had Asperger's, we had high functioning, we had low functioning, we had uh, like classic autism, we had all these different names. And then we decided, well, well, the reason let's use Asperger's for an example. The reason we um, it was Laura Wing, I think, who ori originally coined it, and she wanted Asperger's as a distinct category of autism because she felt that original classic autism was being too stigmatized, and no one wanted to get diagnosed with autism because they saw it as a real negative. So she thought if we kind of split the categories apart, more people will get diagnosed, and they did. But then as kind of culture moved forward and understanding, more people were like discriminating behind, like, oh, you've got normal autism, you've got Asperger's. 
And it was too black and white. And autism is a big spectrum. So as society, culture, understanding changed, we realized that having one diagnosis, ASD, autism spectrum disorder, would be far more useful in making sure that everyone who has similar characteristics of like communications and social interaction can get equal support. So was having an Asperger's diagnosis worse and having ASD better? No, but one was more appropriate for the time when it was most predominantly diagnosed. So to keep that in mind, because a lot of people today still prefer to be known as Asperger's. And that's because that term for them better describes how they understand and sees themselves. So it's not always necessar necessary that time equals improvement. So another thing to keep in mind, um, we've definitely seen things go back in time. Like if you look at politics, you know, every time there's a new policy, it only takes one person to push it back a few decades. We're not always moving forward. Now let's look at a study from Finland, Germany, Hungary, and France. I know, what a lovely combo. So all of these countries got together and decided to do some work. And uh, what I will say is, maybe not on this one, but typically the European Union, they are great at doing research. And the UK will forever be sorry for leaving. We were dumb. <laughs> but the research is great. And I fingers crossed, I think someone can correct me if I'm wrong. I think we are still in that kind of community where we're still putting in money. So we, we haven't left that side. I hope. Now, the next one we're going to look at is from the International Organization of Psychopsychology. Sorry, terrible at pronunciation. But it's from a paper which was called Language Specific Effects on Auditory Brain Responses in Children with Dyslexia in Four European Countries. If that was a bit of a mouthful, it is. So we're going to break it down a bit more about what was this paper even doing? And always worth checking when it was done, because even though 2012 wasn't that long ago, a lot of things have changed and happened since then, such as the neurodiversity movement has grown and grown. So you will notice that even a couple of years ago, the language that's used in studies is quite different. Also, the language in studies tend to be a little bit more clinical. So let's say... A lot of people might say with autism, I'll use that for an example because there's more differences in it. People will now say ASC, autism spectrum condition, because it's more inclusive, it's less negative, which is a great thing. But when we're talking from an academic or kind of a clinical perspective, we will still use ASD because that is the official term. So the official term doesn't always keep up with the cultural terms that we use. So quick question, have you ever lived in more than one country? And this will be relevant because the paper is looking at all those different countries, those four countries that we mentioned. Or was it five? Yes, no. OK, so that's that's a good ring. So uh, two people. Yes, that's good. Oh, Priscilla, yeah, great. Have you? OK, great. So now you've got that in mind. Keep that in your mind. Have you needed to learn a new language? So basically you got went into another country and as a result need to learn another language. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Okay, nice. So now we know that, right? How does that impact dyslexia? Because this has been a really interesting thing that a lot of teachers that I've spoken to have said. They're like, well, if someone is learning a second language and they're struggling with learning that language, how do you know whether or not they have dyslexia? Do you put the, the foreign kids with the same batch of the dyslexics? I don't know. They can get confused. And though they have similar, to, similar characteristics, it is very different in why they are struggling. But it's also very, very possible to have dyslexia and to be learning another language. I have tried to learn French, Spanish, Portuguese, China, um, Mandarin, and I have failed at all of them. I'm awful. And when I said tried, like I had lessons and everything. But my brain just really, really struggles with the retention. It's not impossible for someone who is dyslexic to learn another language. But just bear in mind, it is going to be a lot more work. And 
you are just going to have to put a lot more time and effort into it. So the results of this study were as followed. For language-specific effects on auditory brain responses in children with dyslexia, the, the key bullet point, so you don't have to read this because these reports are really long, is that the study looked at the brain of dyslexics and non-dyslexics. So they had a nice balanced study here to see if processes are the same across languages. So we know people with dyslexia struggle with the reading processes and how they break down phonologics. But is it the same no matter what language you read? If you have dyslexia in one language, are you guaranteed to have dyslexia in the other language? Sure answer, yes. If you have dyslexia, it doesn't matter what language you're speaking, you will have a reading, you will have dyslexia, but it may not affect you in the same way. I've, tell me if you've got your own experiences, but I've spoken to people who said in their native language, their dyslexia affects them significantly, but in their secondary language, normally English, it hasn't been an issue or vice versa, which I find really interesting. This study involved a good sample, but let's face it, 400 could be a bit bigger. So always take that into consideration when you're having a look. The associations between brain responses and behavioral skills varied. In speech versus non-speech, depending on the language environment slash country of the participants. All this is saying is there wasn't really a consensus at the end of it. So yes, the brains all kind of responded differently, but behavior, there was a lot of different factors to take into consideration. So despite being a good study, more research is needed. And one other study, which I think backs this up point up quite well, is one back in um, 1999, is that dyslexia is often overlooked in children that move from one country to another and have to learn a new language while living in a new cultural environment. So if you are moving your children to a new country with a new language, this is something that could possibly be overlooked because though not knowing a language and not being able to read because you haven't learned that language and having dyslexia and struggling to read look very similar on the surface, they are very, very different to how the brain is actually processing. So just worth keeping an eye out it. It seems quite obvious when you say it out loud, but a lot of teachers will not take this into consideration. So a quick quote from the uh, Surgeon's General Report. It's a report they release all the time. It should go to, it says, culture is a concept not limited to patients. Clinicians and service systems naturally immersed in their own culture have been ill-equipped to meet the needs of patients from different backgrounds. What do we mean by this? Well, like I said just previously, teachers or clinicians, professionals, you think that they, they've got their heads switched on, you know, they, uh, they're always pretty in the know. No, because there's always con unconscious bias wherever you are. So culture, such as dyslexia, isn't just limited or different to, to those with dyslexia. It also affects those who are diagnosing you, supporting you. They are not immune to the differences on where you are in the world and how you grew up. So let's say a doctor just, who is really immersed in their own culture may not be equipped to see a condition from your background. So let's put this in another way. Let's say originally you are from India, but you've moved to the UK, for example, and you have dyslexia and you go to get a dyslexic diagnosis. Well, you might actually, they, they might say, actually, you do not have dyslexia because you aren't demonstrating the same characteristics as someone with dyslexia who's born and bred in the UK. And it's because the way we kind of like show it, talk about it, is very, very different. So culture needs to be taken into consideration all the time. Now, this also begs the question, do we need different, like say if you are, you come from an Asian background, do you need a doctor who has that particular experience and expertise? Because you can't just look at a characteristic, you have to speak with the individual. And certain individuals 
might be less inclined to talk about it, which if you aren't familiar with that culture, maybe you won't think, oh, well, they never mentioned it, so I'm going to move right past that. There aren't really yes or no answers to all these questions, but they're definitely questions which are worth thinking about. So China. China is a really, really interesting case study, because if you haven't noticed already, all the countries we've talked about have been Western or heavily influenced by the West. And we do not get many, um, many uh, studies in countries like China. Why? Well, as we've already mentioned, it could be that they have been more focused on other areas of development. It might be due to stigma or a whole heap of reasons. But we do have one study which is particularly interesting, and not just because it's in China, but also because of how they did the study. So the reference we're looking at is environmental risk factors in Han and Zhe. <laughs> Sorry, I'm bad at pronunciation, but hopefully you can read it. Children with dyslexia, a comparative study. So why is this one particularly interesting? Well, they did two separate parts of China. So one, we've got a decent distance apart. But two, the cultures in these regions were very, or are very different. So you've got the same country, same language, I believe, but the culture is significantly different. And this is, uh, is very interesting. So let's look, what did we actually learn from this paper? First of all, a quick question to all of you before I give you the answer. The study found ethnic differences in how prevalent dyslexia was across China. Why do you think this is? So to word it another way, a uh, research document found that pe the ethnic background, because you know China is a very big country, there's different ethnic groups depending where you are, like there are in most large countries, found that how likely you are to have dyslexia varied quite dramatically across China. Economic dis oh, disparities, yeah. You asked, well, okay, the person who said that, basically spot on. It does come down to uh, economic and money and regions. It's just not priorities. Ethnic group dominance over others, favoritism to majority groups. Oh, that's a really good one. Size, yeah. You know, it is so interesting, but there can be different subcultures. So we know, and I, I, can, I can only talk from a UK perspective personally, but in London, we're a very, very diverse um, capital. And that's great. But for instance, in certain cultures that, um, in certain like uh, Muslim cultures in London, there is a massive stigma when it comes to talking about mental health. It is something which unfortunately, there is a higher risk of suicide um, or depression in certain cultures. And even though they're in a country which is predominantly quite progressive with mental health, it doesn't really change the fact from where they're located. And as such, um, a good friend of mine actually runs a charity um, which is just for people who are of the Islamic faith for mental health, which is based in the UK. So really interesting, uh, but the same is true in China. So try not to lump all countries together is why it's much better to talk about culture than it is about country, because it's so different. Like if we were to look at Russia, the culture is like, you know, the country is huge. So that's why it varies dramatically. Moving nicely on. So these were the key takeaways from this study. And there's quite a lot of bullet points in this one because it was pretty interesting. So environmental risk factors with dyslexia sounds a bit dangerous. Dyslexia is nothing to be afraid of. Um, most research has taken place in Western cultures. So for starters, this is a good study because we don't really have that much data for parts of Asia. The study focused on differences in dyslexia rates. So rates, prevalence, you know, tomato, tomato, and environmental factors. That's important because you see some parts of China are like most places in the world, pretty run down, but other places are hustling, bustling, you know, the most technically advanced areas in the world. So you have to take them into consideration. The study involved nearly 3,000 students in China, I think from five separate schools. So this is a good sample size. 
Dyslexia prevalence differed significantly between the regions. As you can imagine, this probably comes from a whole wide range of reasons from understanding from the teachers, from parents having, you know, getting diagnosed, mostly down to economic background, but also stigma. Boys were two times more likely to be diagnosed with dyslexia. And this is something that we see regardless of culture. Like there are there maybe there's one or two examples where females are more likely to have a high diagnostic diagnostic rate. But let's be honest, nine times out of 10, males are more likely to get diagnosed for anything and to get the support they need. This comes down to, you know, women's traditional place in each cultures like your job is to stay at home you know doesn't matter about getting you support but even in if we're looking at a more modern viewpoint when people were originally creating the diagnostic assessments and kind of like shaping what each condition such as dyslexia looks like it was done from a male point of view normally a white old male who came up with this is what it looks like and as a result, that is what we now know it as. Yes, it was a long, long time ago, but these things kind of stick around. Looking again at autism as a comparison, autism was created by white men who worked in labs, and they originally created the criteria by looking at their own studies and their own um, people in their own social circles. And because of that, even like nearly a hundred years later, women are far less likely to be diagnosed because they're, the way they demonstrate their autism doesn't look like how autism is written down on paper. A lesser thing, but still shown is with dyslexia. Now the ethnic differences are thought to potentially be due to the mother's occupation and the frequency in which parents told their children stories. Now, I don't know if you agree with that. For me, this seemed like way too simple, but it's interesting that that was the conclusion that this massive piece of research came to, that depending on what the mother did as a job would depend whether or not the child was likely to be diagnosed or not. I guess that could come down to economic background, it could come down to traditional roles, sexism, I don't know, but that was the findings. Uh, I, I don't think that makes sense. With this mother's occupation, I don't know. Well, I suppose if you're middle class, you're more likely to get more attention and you you, you pick it up quicker. Uh, but I don't think it really, well, I don't think it really makes much difference. What's a mother, what's a mother's father's occupation got to do with anything? Yeah, it, yeah, it might be due to, when I say occupation, like it, whether you're employed or not employed, it might mean, okay, do you have disposable income in order to get a diagnosis? That's one way. But you're right. If you had, if both mothers had equal amounts of money, equal amount of resources and access, their jobs shouldn't matter. But as we know, jobs do play a massive part in what you're able to do and what you're not able to do and where you kind of like you sit in society for better or worse. But yeah, I agree with you. It definitely shouldn't make a difference. And here we've got a frequency in which parents told their children stories. This is a bit of an outdated view that those who do not spend time with their children and read to them are more likely to develop dyslexia. That's not true. But it is true that the exposure to reading at a young age will support someone in developing of their reading and writing skills. So I, I do think, though this study is interesting, you can definitely tell that it came, maybe it came from what we would consider a bit of an outdated perspective. But then again, the, the regions in which they did the study haven't had this type of research done before. So interesting, but I think if a similar study was replicated in Europe, different results would come out. So I think we're on the last one, Turkey. Yay, Turkey. <laughs> so no one from Turkey today. But Turkey's a really interesting uh, case study as well, because it's smack bang in the middle of Europe and Asia. 
So you get the best of both worlds, but also the worst of both worlds, possibly. So the reference we're using is from a university in Turkey, and it was on the knowledge and beliefs of classroom teachers about dyslexia. So do teachers actually know what dyslexia is? I can't speak for other countries, but in the UK, not really. From a teacher I spoke to, they said that they only get one day worth of training in dyslexia through their whole training period. That is not enough. Um, so obviously it's going to go amiss. Now we're in Turkey, you know, maybe it's worse. That would be my assumption, but let's have a look. So quick question. Do you feel teachers understand dyslexia well enough where you live? Yep. Teachers get it. No, teachers do not get it. Okay, we've got one person think yes, which is great. A lot of people said no. Now, this will be interesting because maybe you're answering from your own perspective of when you were a child, or are you answering from a perspective of an adult now and seeing how your children are supported? It is going to impact it. Truthfully, no, I don't think they do have enough understanding, but that doesn't mean that they aren't aware. They just haven't been given the extensive training. Some schools are better than others. Not all are created equal. I do a lot of teaching around in different London schools, and we could be talking schools in the exact same borough. And one school is really good. Another school is terrible. So they are not created equal. But to go back to Turkey, knowledge and beliefs of classroom teachers about dyslexia. So in this study, they found that dyslexia is a really new subject in Turkey. Many people aren't familiar with it. They don't talk about it. It's still something which is new. They found that out of nearly 300 teachers that were assessed on, tech, were assessed on their knowledge and understanding of dyslexia, they had a minimal knowledge. Uh, that's kind of academic speech for saying they didn't really know much at all about dyslexia. And they did not feel ready to teach children with dyslexia. So if they had a dyslexic student who actually felt comfortable to say they had dyslexia and to disclose their dyslexia, they wouldn't really know what to do with that student. Yes, we've moved past the times where people were mean to students, mean to kids with dyslexia. Yes, it may still happen, but typically teachers are pretty nice nowadays, I would say. But that doesn't mean that they have the toolkit necessary in order to best support students. So a quick timeline of where we are with dyslexia. In the 1877, it was known as word blindness. People thought it was to do with your eyesight. It's not. Then moving on to 1887, the word dyslexia is first used in the English language. So it's been around a while now. Then in 1962, Dyslexia is first actually mentioned in Parliament. So yes, it may have been first spoken about yonks ago. It wasn't really formally acknowledged in society or, I mean, sorry, in our, system, in our structures like Parliament and government. Again, this is from a UK perspective, but I imagine it'd be probably later in other countries because, dyslexia, because the UK traditionally has been quite good at research in the past. In 1970, we came up with the Disability Persons Act. So finally, only in the 70s was dyslexia allowed to have rights, you know, where people told you shouldn't discriminate. That's really not that long ago. So it gives you an idea about why it has changed so dramatically. I remember going back to the bit where I talked about how autism was originally diagnosed and why those who are um, uh, females are less likely to be diagnosed, despite just as likely to have autism. The same thing is true with dyslexia. So if you are male, if you are white, if your parents are educated, if you are middle class, you are far, far more likely to be diagnosed with dyslexia. Why? Why are those white rich kids more likely to be dyslexic? Well, they're not. But those are the individuals who are more likely to get tested and to get the support necessary. This isn't a good thing, but it's good that we are aware of it because then we can be hopefully more observant and try to give like different grants and supports in place. Unfortunately, most people who need to get diagnosed with dyslexia has to do it private, the vast majority. Certain schools do have budget, 
but this isn't like an endless pot. Despite more people being diagnosed from a white middle-class background, dyslexia is on the rise in minority groups, but why? Any thoughts or opinions on why minority groups around the world are rising in the amount that resonate with being dyslexic? I don't know about around the world, but I don't know from an ethnic minority perspective. Um, it's becoming, uh, well, the next generation, there's, there's more awareness. They, um, I think it's, it seems to be a, a normal thing. Autism, you hear children saying autism. Uh, autism or Asperger's, got Asperger's, so it's part and parcel of it. So it's, it's just, I think people, there's, there's more awareness on it and there's more knowledge around TV and other um, channels. So, yeah, that's why people have got more knowledge about it. But whether they look into it more depth is a different issue. They know mm -hmm. the basics, yeah. Yeah, no, Fosana, I, th I think you're really spot on there. There is more awareness. Um, there has traditionally been, like, lack of support. So more people and as we know we are being more inclusive as a society so even in home settings where maybe dyslexia isn't talked about in school systems which are integrated the fingers crossed do not discriminate as much so the support will be available in schools colleges universities they so can give the support that is actually needed so fingers crossed i mean it's looking positive but it's still worth knowing that though there is a rise, it's due to understanding. It isn't due to some sort of epidemic. Um, I know all of you don't see that, but some people do. We've got increases in academic success, social status, more awareness. What name would you least like to be diagnosed with? And this is a real quick one. So if someone says, OK, you're going to be diagnosed with word blindness, a learning difficulty or a brain disorder. And this also has a big, big impact on culture because we're using the word dyslexia here, but all around the world, it's called different things and they have different meanings. So some people will still consider it a brain disorder or like a mental challenge, depending on what it's called, has a really big impact to how people report and talk about different studies. So let's have a look. Brain disorder. Yeah, the word disorder isn't a nice word. Um, it really says there's something wrong with you. But remember, there are different meanings from a clinical perspective, from just like a societal one. Societally, I don't like being called like ASD, but from like a clinical point of view, I get why that is the go-to name. With dyslexia, most people know it as dyslexia now, but it's interesting that only 100 years ago, word blindness, and they thought it was to do with, to do with sight. Who knows what in another hundred years we are going to look at dyslexia with. It will probably definitely almost certainly change. Any last comments, opinions or thoughts on today's subject? It's been a bit of a, a varied one, but it's, it's really interesting to see. And we've only hit the nail on the head here. There are so many different cultures and views and opinions on where dyslexia is, but it's definitely something we should be taking a more active notice of. As our countries are becoming more integrated and there's more diversity, we have to look at um, the way we support people with a cultural lens. Okay, nice. Well, I'm going to say that's good. Feel free to message me if you do. The next webinar, though, we're doing, because we do them every Thursday, is going to be dyslexia and sex. Sounds sexy. It's not. It, we're literally talking about gender um biological gender so going right down on the scientific level what is the difference between those who are born male to those who are born female really interesting and there's a hundred percent is a difference so we will deep dive into that and really quickly go on our youtube channel like and subscribe we've got ones on the science of reading the the controversial history of hans asperger's science of autism, some really good stuff there. And we need those likes. Future webinars, we've got so many coming up. Okay, some of these are out of date, but we have webinars all the time. And last but certainly not least, 
Here's our details if you want to get in contact and uh, stay in touch. Thanks for the lovely comments, everyone. And I hope you're able to get a few uh, nuggets of knowledge out of today. Nice. Thanks, everyone. And I'll hopefully see you next week. Bye, Sandra. Thanks for coming. Thanks, April, as always. OP7, lovely stuff. Farzana, perfect.